Act, and it was lost actually in 2014. But that seed bank, which it, it's the name we call it, is ACARDA, which is an acronym, I C A R D A. Um, they had made a backup copy of their collection at Svalbard. So when the scientists had to evacuate, leaving the collection in place, they were able to reconstitute the collection in two separate locations in Morocco and in Libya. And I don't know how those two backup, you know, those two new sets uh, have fared in the recent floods and earthquakes. Right. But they they were able to regenerate the collection and then actually grow out the crops far enough to get another set of seed to send back to Svalbard. I think they're wow. almost completely have replenished their supply there. And. There was a lot of controversy about Svalbard when it when it first went into being that 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 there were concerns, which, you know, I, I think they're valid concerns and things we should always be mindful of, but that corporate interests or profit interests or, you know, people wanting to control all these genetics in one place were um were behind this collection. And and I think that has been proven otherwise, and that for the most part, uh, there have been really good checks and balances. So only a depositor, so like the, the collection in Syria, only those authorized depositors can actually take out their authorized deposits. Like they can't take out yeah. anybody else's deposits. Not even the administrators at Svalbard can access the collections they hold there. So wow. it's like a it's like a safety deposit box in what used to be, you know, Switzerland. I mean, it still is Switzerland, but, right. you know, a safety deposit box in a safe place that you have the key to. The agricultural equivalent of a Swiss bank account. Exactly. Yeah. When we thought Switzerland was neutral. Right. <laughs> yes. We found Let's out. Let's not go there. We've, Let's not go yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if, if people are taking seeds out that shouldn't be and but uh, I mean, it, it, it could uh, uh, happen. But uh, what interests me is the, the fact that Svalbard itself has, has come under some threat. My, my recollection is that it was subject uh, to some to some flooding or, or something along those lines. Yeah. It was in yeah. danger so, because of climate change. Well, Yes, and and thankfully no. Uh, it got a lot of press when the permafrost experienced some melting. I mean, the mm. reason they chose the site is that it's one of the most globally stable sites of cold. And of course, yeah. cold and dark stable conditions are your friends when it comes to storing seed for long right. term. Right. And um, but the the construction of Svalbard is such that none of that uh, melt got into any came even came near the actual seed vaults. Okay. Um, and so, well, I can't guarantee you it's going to hold forever. I think it's one of our best chances. Yeah. And as I understand Svalbard is the furthest north, like continuously inhabited, like a uh, city in the world. Is, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Svalbard is the name of the archipelago right, and right. it's an island uh, in that archipelago. Where okay. The right. Sits. Yeah, I, I think I'm thinking of long year by which is in, in Svalbard, but uh, that's a good, that's a good place for it. Um, so here's, here's another question. And I think this, this gets at some of the, um, the corporate questions that we were alluding to. Can you own a seed or can you own a particular kind of seed? And if so, why, and, and what impact does that have on, on how things work in agriculture and in the global ecosystem? Right. And it's a, it's a good question and it's a complicated answer in that if you ask me, no, you can't really own a seed. But if you ask the USDA in the patent office, yes, you can uh, own a seed. Now, if the patent and or um, variety rights are being administered correctly, then in theory, you should not be able to uh, obtain a utility right or a patent right. <clears throat> on a seed that would or could occur naturally. So, you know, when you consider the beneficence of the the plant systems on our planet and all that they have provided for us and given to us in common, including our seeds, um, it seems sort of 
you know, uh, counterintuitive to think that we would allow anyone to own a seed. And land-based peoples the world over cringe at this, just like they cringe at private land ownership. It yeah. contracts the commons. And so, but but yes, as genetic modification and engineering has come online, as plant breeders have been working the world over to hybridize and breed interesting new plants or productive plants, in our privatized world, we have moved to a model wherein if you have worked to create a breed or a hybrid um, and you and it has taken off, you have the patented rights to that seed. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of this in, in, in U.S. terms, but yep. to what extent is that, that seed patent system global? Is, is that universal or are there exceptions It's pretty to that? global. So when you – when for instance, let's say um, many of these patents have gone to our four large uh, – pharmaceutical petrochemical companies who right. control something like 60% of our seed and something like 85% of all uh, patented corn are owned by like Monsanto, Bear Monsanto. Yeah. So most of these <clears throat> patents are going to people who are then producing seed that is in theory not allowed to be saved and then regrown again by anyone else. And and these larger corporations have and do go after people for reproducing their patented uh, seed in the world. Right. And, and the consequences, like to, to answer that question, I'm sorry, I just jumped over you, but you know the, the consequences to that are that not only is our biodiversity contracting because of right. their choices on what we should or shouldn't eat and what they sell us and what's available in the market and because we're destroying habitat, uh, but they are contracting because of this ownership model that goes against all that civilizations have been have been progressed on over centuries, millennia. Right. And the way these seeds are engineered, too, it's designed to lock farmers into their use yes. uh, b because yeah. of the way they interact with pesticides. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So the, you know, Roundup Ready corn, um, and at this point, the USDA and EPA believe that 100% of non-organic corn, no matter where it comes from, shows residue of this Roundup Ready pesticide um, systemically. And, you know, whether it's Roundup exactly or just some of its active ingredients, it is very persistent in our environment. <clears throat> and the... Yeah, so that prevalence is is scary uh, and, again, diminishes not only our ecosystem's health, but also our choices and control as people who eat, who restore ecosystems, who live in the world. Yeah. It, it's also notable <laughs> or, or noteworthy, uh, probably no, more than noteworthy, that uh, the way these many of these ca companies came about – or what led into them in terms of, you know, forming our countries, forming these corporations is a bunch of Europeans going out and uh, stealing seeds from indigenous peoples around the world mm -hmm. and claiming, mm -hmm. claim, claiming them for their own, not just in the United States, but all over the world. That's exactly right. And that is it is it is one of the most insidious forms of colonialism, if you ask me, especially after doing these research. And, you know, you'll hear stories like uh, the 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 very famous seed keeper in India, Vandana Shiva. She coalesced a group of people who had to fight for, I think, 20 years to get the mm. patent on the neem tree removed, a patent uh, that was sought and granted to the United States government and one of these large petrochemical companies on the neem tree, which is a sacred and ancient plant in India, native plant of India, famous for its anti, uh, uh, anti or its pest resistant oils right. uh, and its medicinal, its ritual. And the fact that we were ever granted uh, a patent on it is shows you the um, the failures of oversight in such a an overreach of a patent. 
Well, that, that's a heartening story in the face of such uh, pervasive patent capitalism. Is there a, mm-hmm. a growing uh, seed socialism that's uh, rising up around the world? Yeah. There is. There really, really is. And so if all of this research that I did about, you know, pesticides and herbicides and poison seeds and poisoned ecosystems and corporate greed and consolidation were disheartening, uh, it was the stories of people like Rowan White out of uh, here in Northern California, who is the founder of the Indigenous Seed Keepers Alliance, or Kristen Leach and... Um, and her group of second generation seed keepers who are really protecting the and and actually expanding the seeds of the Asian diaspora and uh, Ira Wallace and uh, Chris Boldham Newsom down in the southeast who are working on seeds of the African diaspora, really trying to return and, and recover seed of their cultural uh, heritage and get it replanted and and regenerated and reshared in community. It was these seed keepers and and this abundance of seed knowledge that is still out there um, and we need to support it. Uh, that is what gave me hope. That and, and just the miraculous diversity of seed in our world, just walking down your street, right? Walking on your trails in the Willamette Valley there uh, or the Rogue Valley. Right, um, right. Exactly. Well, the we're, we're, we're a little dry than the Willamette Valley. <laughs> right, okay. But but just like that diversity of yeah. native plant seed that's reproducing all the time every year and we, we fail to see it so often. Just that level of appreciation gave me hope. That's awesome. And I, I will tell you, uh, you know, we uh, were, you know, speaking of, we were starting by talking about uh, wildfires and wildfire smoke, you know, um, uh, our place burned down in the Almeida fire in, in 2020. Mm. And and one of the things that I miss most about not living in that place anymore is that we had a, um, a hazelnut tree that every mm. year at this time of, time of year would, mm. would just drop so many wonderful hazelnuts and we would uh, take them and we would, uh, you know, roast them and eat them and give them to friends and let them pick up some of them. And it's... Uh, while there are still plenty of those trees in the valley, it, it, it's, it strikes me that, you know, those things are precious. I mean, they're, they're yeah. precious to us as human beings in addition to being precious to the wider environment. And it really is incumbent upon us to make great efforts in order to protect, protect them and, and perpetuate them because uh, they're important. And they 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 they're, they they mean something to us, and they mean something to every living thing. Uh, Jennifer Jewell, thank you so much for uh, being here uh, again. The book uh, "Cultivating Places: The Name of Your Podcast" and what we sow on the personal, ecological, and cultural significance of seeds is the book. Please check that out. Thank you so much for being with us today on Facepalm America. Oh, thank you so much for hosting me. It was a pleasure to make your acquaintance and and chat about these things we clearly both care a lot about. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. This program has been produced by Ace Elson and Rosabel Hine. If you would like more information, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, you can go to facepalmamerica.com and you can message and call us anytime at 202 656 Six two seven one, and until next time, enjoy the day. <laughs> <laughs>